Hello, hello, Dale Majors here, and today on the channel, I have Lauren Lockman. When, when I've done water fasting, and I did my seven-day water fast, it was awesome, good experience, a really new experience for me, and while I was researching, I found Lauren online, and he really kind of just shed a whole lot more light on topics in, of, about water fasting that I didn't know of before, so I reached out to him, and I wanted to kind of do a play-by-play of what my fa how how I fasted, my experience, and get his take on fasting, how I should have done it differently. He talks about you know salt intake while fasting and autophagy and all these different things. And I came to find out he's a fruitarian, which I didn't even really know that. I, I knew that they existed, but I'd never really met one and spoke with one at length. So it was a really interesting interview, and he shared a lot of uh, nuggets. So, anyways, I will let you listen to it. Thank you so much. Let me tell you about how I started my fast. Okay. And you can tell me um, how you would have done it differently. So okay. I've wanted to do a seven day for a long time. Uh -huh. I, I was at a youth camp and I'd been eating tons of food. Three meals yeah. a day, right. lots of carbs, lots of right. just teenager right. food. And, and I felt really bad. So my brother who struggled with some chronic um, autoimmune stuff, maybe we're not really sure. Yeah. He was looking into fasting and he thought, hey, Dale, do you want to do a seven day fast with me? And I thought, nah, not really, but I would do three or five this time. Right. So I started that, that text came in at seven o'clock and I started it right then. Got it. So I'd been eating tons. And so you've, been plan you've been planning for, for like 60 seconds. I'd happened. been planning. It was, a, it was a 90 second deliberation through text. But gotcha. yeah. So yeah, it's, good, it's good to plan ahead like that. Yeah, a little spontaneous. Um, <laughs> but day one was bad. Day two was bad. And I waited for day three. And day three was bad too. Right. So how? So what would you do differently and why? Well, you, you haven't told me much except that you decided at the last minute to start fasting. And, and you know, I should say... Uh, by the way, you, you're, if you don't already know this, you're going to figure it out pretty quickly anyway. But you know, just just to say, um, Jason Fung and I have very different viewpoints okay. on, many, on many things, and so what I would do is certainly not what he would do. Um, we don't. If you want to talk about diet at some point, we can do that. But we have very different philosophies about diet as well. Okay. So you know, what I have people do is adopt what I believe is the optimal diet for the human body. Every species has their natural diet. Uh, she's a carnivore. She's an obligate carnivore. Um, that's Bandita. And they have to consume meat. Um, you and I, if we consume meat, we age and die faster. We uh, destroy our, our, our immune system, our, our uh, digestive tract, our liver and kidneys are the most taxed with this. And so what we hear is we have people start by spending two or three weeks or more if they're willing to, keeping their diet as simple as possible. And when I say simple, I mean high water content fruit and simple salads. Okay. Now that's all I eat now um, for 27 and a half years. And that's what I recommend everybody do in, to prepare for the fast because it allows the body to begin detoxing much more heavily right away, which means you start further ahead and you get more out of the process because of that. Um, and, and, I sh and I should say too, Dale, that honestly, I mean, it would be good for anyone if they're doing their first fast, even if it's seven days, I would still recommend this. Now, you know, as you may be aware, most of the work I do uh, over the last 22 and a half years that I've been running Tangle with and supervising fasts, our average fast here is 26 days. Wow. That's average. Average is 26 days. Yeah. In the last year, I've probably had two clients that fasted for a week. Uh, you know, where, where I've, I mean, I fasted hundreds of people in the last year, and most of them have been uh, 21 days, 26 days, 30, 35, 42, or even longer sometimes. Uh, very few fasts that are as short as yours was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. I usually increase their water intake. Uh -huh. because most most people are, are severely dehydrated. Over the last uh, 13 and a half years, we've measured more than 3,000 clients, and virtually everyone's severely dehydrated compared to where they could be. 
And I believe that makes a profound difference in terms of how we feel and function. Okay, so, so, so hydration is a big thing that you focus on going into the fast. High water content, fruit, lots right. of salads, but just, right. so you're saying that most of us walking around or walking around dehydrated. Yeah, uh, we, we see that the average person we measure here is about 85% hydrated, about 15% dehydrated. Now, by the way, medicine says that's not possible, but I believe the explanation for that's simple. People that are well hydrated don't get sick, I mean, ever. So I'm the most hydrated person we've ever measured. Uh, we've been measuring for 13 years. I've been measured many times. Uh, mm -hmm. We've never seen anyone as hydrated as I am. I haven't been sick a day in 32 years, not a single day. And so... I believe that's something anyone can accomplish. I started out being very sick. That's what got me on this path. And I'm sure it's more than just drinking water. It is actually drinking water is never going to hydrate anyone. Um, what we're really trying to do by drinking water is prevent ourselves from getting more dehydrated. Um, okay. In order to hydrate, what we need to do is actually clean the body out. And again, I don't know what Fung's approach is on this. But uh, the, the MD who recently left True North uh, Fasting Center in California uh -huh. um, after eight years, uh, ironically, years and years ago, uh, Dr. Michael Clapper had a radio program out of Washington, D.C., and whenever he was in town every two weeks to, to shoot his, to record his show, he would come to our events. If, if we had something going on that weekend, he would often come. I got to know him reasonably well. I told him about fasting. He had trouble believing some of the things I was telling him, you know, because where medicine, for instance, says that you can't cure hypertension, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, Lyme disease, multiple sclerosis, uh, Crohn's disease, many other conditions. These are all conditions that we see healing all the time. And with hypertension and type 2 diabetes, so far, I have 100% success. Uh, with more than 500 hypertensive clients in 22 plus years and with more than 75 type 2 diabetics. Wow. Uh, every one of those people completes their process with us with no disease, no need for medication, no issues, no blood sugar issues. You know, no, no. In fact, the hypertensive clients are usually, not only are they normal, they're actually below normal. At 120 over 80, they're still heart attacks and strokes. At 110, systolic pressure and blow, there virtually never is. And yeah. that's, where our, that's where our clients usually get, actually get to a healthy level because 120 already is not a healthy level of pressure. That's just a normal level, level yeah. of pressure. So, so in order to, to get the, the body truly clean, we have to get this old material out of the digestive tract. Now, doctors have said for years, this stuff doesn't exist. And Michael Clapper, this MD who spent eight years supervising fasts, recently put up a video. Someone forwarded it to me after. I, I uh, put up a video a couple months ago, I think, two, maybe six or eight weeks ago, talking about mucoid plaque, this old hard material in the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe it exists because the thousands of clients I've fasted, virtually every single one eliminates pounds and pounds of stuff, which is hard painful to eliminate sometimes, very foul smelling. You know, when they start eating, the watermelon, papaya, mangoes, and pineapples, and, and lettuce we're feeding them, those bowel movements are quick, easy, painless, clean, and order-free, if that's all it is. Um, and that, that's how bowel movements should be in a healthy body. That's how mine are. Um, that's, that's what happens. The stuff that they are walking around with, if they come in still with some stuff in their digestive tract, so they're eliminating over those first uh, four or five days or so, uh, as some people do. Those bowel movements are quite different. The stuff that people are eliminating by the time they're four or five days into refeeding, it only is when it starts usually. That stuff is hard, it's often painful. I mean, in the last year I've had two clients need three hours to pass the, that first bowel movement because it was so hard and, and difficult. Um, this is stuff that's been there for a long time. And there's, there's tons of evidence throughout the process that this is what's going on. In fact, I recently fasted a young man from uh, Canada for the third time. Between his second and third fasts, he was diagnosed with cancer, uh, colon cancer. And his, he, they wound up removing his entire colon because it was completely dead tissue. 
completely red on the tumors, but black dead tissue wasn't functioning. They took it out. He now has an ileostomy. So his small intestine comes through an opening in his abdomen that they created and dumps into a bag like a fanny pack he wears around his waist every day. Wow. He has to dump this out and clean it out. He fasted with me this last time for 42 days. Every single day, there was material coming from the small intestine into the bag every day for 42 days after his last meal. That's so crazy. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, there was actually a study published in Denmark a few years ago that said that 5 to 10 kilos, 11 to 22 pounds, is not unusual. Okay. Yeah. I see it here. I see it here. And I, wow. you know, in fact, it sounds crazy. Think about this. Um, most people, That's you know, how many... Crazy. That's crazy that, you know... Well, how, how many times a day do you think the average person's eating something? Um, the average person? Yeah. 11? 11 times a day? Okay. Um, you know, I've pulled, I pulled the people that come to me, and they're not average. We snack pe- a lot, but... The people that come to me are people who are typically more health conscious than average. Okay. And the, the, the people that come to my uh, lectures and seminars when I travel and speak, as well as here at the center... It seems to me that five is, is about the average number, at least what they're willing to admit to. Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. More, right? So uh, think about it this way. We're going to talk in, you, you familiar with the metric system? Familiar enough? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's 28 grams in an ounce. So a gram is pretty small. Yep. Okay. Imagine that every time someone had a meal, only five times a day, not 11, but only five times a day, they're eating something that a tiny crumb-sized piece gets stuck and doesn't move through, okay? Let's call that tiny crumb-sized piece one-tenth of a gram. Okay. It's not very much. That's one two hundred and eightieth of an ounce for the Americans listening, right? Okay. So if there's if there are five meals a day, then that's half a gram per day. Mm-hmm. And in, in the course of a year, it's 182 and a half grams. Yeah, so pound every three years or something. Uh, well, yeah. let me, let me do it this way. In 10 years, that's, that's 1800 grams, which is nearly two kilos, mm. which let's call it four pounds instead of 4.4 pounds. Cause it's not yeah. quite two kilos, yep. right? So four pounds every 10 years, roughly. Yeah. All right. In 50 years, yeah. that's 20, that's 20 pounds. Yep. Well, the body's running on its reserve tissue. It's, con- it's converting muscle and fat to, to, for fuel, right? And, and why muscle? Well, first of all, our bodies are set up to run on sugar, and there's no, there's no sugar available from fat metabolism. So most of the body can switch over to running on ketones, but your brain and a couple other vital organs require sugar. So throughout the process, there's going to be some sugar converted to some muscle converted to sugar. But at the beginning of the process, the body runs actually primarily on muscle, and then it begins to, to run on fat about three, three and a half days into the process. And again, we actually measure this. We can see how much muscle mass people are losing. Uh, it, it drops, you know, the second week is half the, the first, the third week is half the second. Uh, you know, it, it, it drops off significantly, but it's a fair amount at first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bendy likes the limelight, I guess. Um, so we, we can see this, we can see that this is happening. It's always happening. Um, and we can see that the, as we are measuring people, we can actually see body fat going up. Now body fat can't go up, right? But we see this when we measure people because the machine thinks that mass it can't account for is, is fat. It's, but this is actually the old stuff in there that's, that's holding water. I've got a 81 year old who's fasting with me via Skype. So not only do we, do we fast hundreds of people a year here at Tanglewood, but I also work with five people at a time, usually a maximum of five at a time. So I have time for everything via Skype, 30 minute appointments every day. You need to get off that day, uh, 30 minutes. And there's one right now who's on day 16 of her fast with me. She's 81 years old. For the last seven days, her weight hasn't changed at all, hasn't dropped. How's that possible? I have no idea. It's only possible. So so she's drinking water 
Right. Her body's just kind of, I don't know. Yeah. She, it looks like she's not losing weight. Now, she has to lose weight because her body's using its own tissue for fuel. Uh huh. But what's happening is, she, at the same time as she's losing weight, she's been holding water as she rehydrates this old material. And typically, yeah. the older somebody is, the more of it there is because it accumulates. You know, we, we looked at 20 pounds at the age of 50, if someone's accumulating one tiny crumb with each meal, at, yeah. the, age, at the age of 80. It's another 12, yeah. It would be another 12 pounds or so. Yep. Exactly. Okay, so this, this is why we see this happening. We see it happening over and over again. But anyway, in order to get hydrated, you have to get that stuff out of your body because as long as it's there, your body's going to try to hydrate it. And it's never going to be able to get rid of it because it takes weeks of resting to break it down and enough water coming into hydrated enough. And so you want resting. So it takes resting to break it down. The body, yes, the body has to be able to focus on breaking this stuff down, which it's not doing if you're living your busy active life. Yeah. Okay. This, this is why fasting is about resting as completely as possible. I've seen some of these people online that definitely are like, Hey, I'm taking the time off and others almost, you know, with pride, I'm not seeing videos of them doing it, but they're saying, oh, I work out every day, my strength yeah. is the same, and I still do this. And I'm thinking, for reals? Like, I'd love to, and because I, on day two and a half, I played table tennis. My brother and I played competitive table tennis, and I played for like an hour. Yeah. And I drank a water bottle too quickly, and I went to the garbage can and threw up. Right. Like, um, it wasn't, my body was saying, yeah, probably not a good idea or something, but... Yeah, definitely not a good idea. And by, by the way, you know, we can debate forever on questions of diet and et cetera, lifestyle choices. Yeah. What, what I've been doing, I, I started studying nutrition when I was uh, 15, which has been about 10 years now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, actually, it's actually been about 43 years ago. Uh -huh. And um, I've, been, I've been focused on health and nutrition ever since. Hey, um, so there are 25 million species, it's estimated, in nature, animal species, most of which are insects. Virtually every species, when it gets sick enough or badly enough injured, will lie down and stop eating. Okay, virtually every single Interesting. one. Interesting. Okay, they lie down. So they're sick and they rest. That's all they do. Now, most people are, yeah, but the people you're talking about, they're going, yeah, but I'm not sick. Right. But, but the point is... When animals want to heal as much as they can, they lay down and rest. Now, here's the thing. You know, if you go to Facebook, there's a bunch of fasting forums. I actually, I actually moderate when I started one. I'm hardly ever there anymore. I don't pay any attention to it because my commitment is to helping people who are committed to their health. Yeah. That's what I'm focused on. I want to help people maximize their potential. And when I say maximize their potential, I mean create all the amazing things they're capable of creating in life. I believe everyone's got genius and everyone can manifest amazing things, but most people never even figured out what they're passionate about. Yeah. You know, there, a lot of people are stuck in jobs because they, they want some security. They think it's what they should do. They think it'll be safe. And, you know, and so they, they never, they, they hate, they go home, they come home and they hate their job and they, you know, they, they party on weekends and go back to the grind on Mondays. This is the way people talk. Yep. yep. I, I wake up as I, I suspect you do, because I know you're an entrepreneur and you you started something, you're doing something you enjoy as am I, right? Yep. Um, Tanglewood is, is 22 and a half years old. I wake up every morning excited because I know that people's lives are being changed. This morning, I had a guy you know, tell me he had this incredibly profound experience. This is a guy who's on his fourth day of refeeding after 21 days fasting, feels better than ever, came in with some serious issues to heal, and is now feeling better than he's felt in, in years. And you know, was profoundly moved by this. And we see this here all the time. Mm -hmm. This is what keeps me going even when it's challenging. But I take my lessons from nature, okay? You can believe whatever you want. I don't believe nature's wrong, ever. Mm -hmm. right? If every species lays down to give the body, and, and the reason why is simple. The processes, the restorative processes, cleansing, healing, growth, repair, that are happening when we're fasting, happening much more effectively than when fasting than any other time, those processes require energy. If we're taking in no fuel, no food for mm -hmm. fuel, and we're still being active, how's the body gonna do any of that stuff? Well, the answer is it doesn't. And this is why people who stay active, it's actually much easier for them in most cases. 
because they're not cleansing or healing to any significant degree. And they're like, fasting's no big deal. Well, try laying down and resting. You're, they probably find that they didn't feel so good. Yeah. But a lot of these people, like on the forum, a lot of these forums, a lot of these people, all they're trying to do, all they're really interested in is losing weight. Yeah. That's, and if, yeah. yeah, I think that's, I think that's where the fasting thing gets really dangerous. Exactly. Uh, approaching it. You know, I saw, I saw a video of this 133 pound girl saying, I'm going to fast for 11 days and I'm really watching my weight really closely. And then she broke the fast with potato chips, Sour Patch Kids, and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I'm thinking, you're going to kill yourself. Like, and she said, oh, it hurt so bad, and I had a really bad stomach ache. Like, yeah. Right. What, what, a, what a surprise. You're crazy. Right. You know? Yeah. It's, it's that, insane. Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, where, I, with mine, I wanted to share my experience and say this is what it is, but also, you know, bring in, that's why I'm talking to you, bring in a little more knowledge and wisdom into here, Dale, you know, you don't do it that way. That's, you know, that's why I'm happy that we're having this conversation. It was yeah, well, I, videos that I saw at first of like, wow, you took it so seriously. And I'm thinking, whoa, I didn't even really know this was much of a thing. I know that I'm supposed to ease into it, but. Right. You, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you, Dale. You know, it varies from person to person. So when I break a seven, eight fast, and I've done many of them, I, I fasted now approximately three years of my life cumulatively. Bozer, okay. Um, so, I mean, I have a tiny bit of experience personally, and I've, I've, I've probably fasted, and I say personally fasted, because, you know, at True North, they claim to have fasted more people than I have, but their average fast is around 10 days. And Alan Goldhammer, the owner of the center, doesn't supervise fasts anymore. He runs a business. People that go there, most of them don't even need him, Okay. I personally, I'm personally interacting with every client myself. And, and honestly, that will at some point have to change because I, there's a limited amount of time and I don't yeah. have enough time to do everything I need to do now. Yeah. So I need to find a way to replicate myself. But, but the point is, there are probably very few people alive today. Some of my mentors had a tremendous amount of experience, but unfortunately, most of them are dead now. These were all guys who today would have been, you know, in their 90s or even 100 if they were still alive. There are very few people alive who've actually supervised more fast than I have, or probably fasted more than I have. Yeah. I've, I've worked out what works, and it works over and over again consistently. And when I fast for a week, I don't really, it's, for me, it's, I just go have a meal. Um, but when someone doesn't have is the experience, then they need to be much more cautious. And because our average fast is 26 days and our shortest fast is around 21, we always take it very slowly. Um, yeah. It's important. You know, when you're breaking your, when you broke your fast, let's talk about you for a second. You fasted for seven days mm -hmm. and your body probably would have been quite happy to keep going. Okay. Yes. Because yeah. the body, the body wants to eat day, six, day seven, I was fine. I didn't, the only reason I really wanted to start eating was I wanted to have energy for some activities that I was doing, you know? Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, even, even if you feel miserable while fasting, your body probably wants you to keep going because what your body is, is wanting to do is to cleanse and heal. And fasting is this incredible opportunity that the body doesn't normally have. So even when it's, it feels challenging and you're thinking this sucks, I don't want to be doing this. Your body is going, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, imagine someone that's 250 pounds and they're telling me on day three that they're experiencing some hunger. Maybe they need to eat. Okay. I mean, unless that person's eight feet tall, there's no way they need to eat at that point. Um, the body's not going to experience hunger until it actually needs fuel or nutrients. And our need for nutrients when we're fasting is almost negligible. There's a whole physiological change. So, you know, if you go four to six weeks with no fresh food, no vitamin C, you will develop scurvy four to six weeks. But I fasted more than 500 people for six weeks or longer. And my longest client fast ever was 18 and a half weeks, four and a half months, just water, no nutrients. So, so say that again, if you, if you go four to five weeks, you'll four to six weeks, what you'll develop scurvy. If you're eating, but you're not eating any fresh food and you're not eating fresh food, you'll develop scurvy. If you're not eating at all, you can go six weeks and you will not develop scurvy. I, I've taken clients as long as four and a half months with no nutrients, just water. 
and they've not a single one has developed a deficiency condition as a result of that. No, absolutely not. And if you take salt, you're not fasting. Well, I, I totally broke. I took a three. I took a teaspoon of salt, and then I took three little fizz tablet things. Yeah, but but is, so there, the physiological state is different. Um, yeah. And in some ways, it was harder for you because because if you're consuming nutrients, your body thinks there's food coming. It doesn't actually ever change completely over to the fasting physiology. It's a whole different thing. Yeah. So even because I know that you know Jason Fung and other people are like, well, you can have bone broth, and I think they really are approaching it from some of a different angle. I think because a lot of a lot of it, a lot of everybody's so I think infatuated with ketosis and that whole deal where it's like, oh yeah, you won't throw yourself out of it. Ketosis means that your body is running on ketones. Uh huh. Now that's all it means. It means that your body's metabolizing fat and using ketones in place of sugar for most of the body's functions because we normally run on glucose, uh-huh. right? Now, and there are people now who are you know, putting themselves on diets where they're in ketosis all the time. By the way, the science is uniformly clear about this. You know, those, you know, those few people who say, no, this is a good thing. Science in general is clear. This is not a good thing. It doesn't lead to a higher level of health. There's no, you know, we're, we're, we're clearly intended to run on glucose. Yeah. When we don't eat, what the body does is it goes and gets glycogen from the liver, which it turns into glucose. It's not immediately looking for ketones. It's looking for glucose, okay? We're glucose burners. And so this is why, again, we, you know, we stop eating. When we run out of glycogen, the body says, you know, your body doesn't know. My clients' bodies don't know that they've decided they're not going to eat for uh, 25 more days or 40 more days or whatever it might be. They just know, hey, it's been a day. There's, there's no fuel coming in. We need a little bit of sugar. What should we do now? And so the body says, well, we could switch over to running on fat, but that's a whole change. We're set up to run on sugar. Let's just take a tiny bit of muscle convert it to sugar. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a name for that process because science is really clear. This is what happens. People out there denying this, you know, they, they don't really know what they're talking about. But the body goes into this process called gluconeogenesis where it begins to convert muscle to sugar because the body's running on sugar and it says, well, just need a tiny bit of sugar. Let's just take a tiny bit of muscle. It's not like the body's trying to cannibalize all your muscles. It's just saying, well, it's a short-term thing. And it keeps doing that until it gets to the point where it says, all right, hang on. Now it's been three days on average. It's been three days. There's still no food coming in. Maybe we don't want to keep taking muscle. Let's go ahead and switch over uh, to fat now. And that's, that's, that's what starts to happen. But being in ketosis only means your body's running on ketones. It does not mean that your body is detoxifying or healing at a faster rate. I don't. I, I personally, I, I don't, I would have to disagree with you a little bit here because, I mean, yes, you can accomplish different things with different diets. Obviously, if someone goes to a ketogenic diet where the body's burning fat, they're going to lose fat faster. Mm-hmm. But at what, co- at what cost? You know, again, th- this is stressful so to the liver. The toll, the toll that it takes, the toll that all those foods take on the body, even though the pounds are going. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, so... I personally think it's always a mistake to focus on weight loss. I, I, you know, I understand I work with people who are, who are quite large. I've got a man here now that came in fast me for the second time. This time around, he was 370 pounds when he arrived. Okay. Uh, I, I know, you know, these people want to lose weight, but people who are focused on losing weight, you know, what's occurred to me over the years, I mean, they'll do all kinds of crazy things. It, it's occurred to me that if you went to some of them and said, hey, did you ever think about the fact that if you cut your leg off, you could drop 50 pounds like that? They go, shit, I should have thought of that. Yeah. Right? So yeah, not I mean, good. We, we don't want to focus on the number on the scale. I'm, as I said to you before, I'm completely focused on helping people maximize their potential. And one vehicle to do that, I mean, basically that's about creating the highest levels of physical health, emotional health, spiritual health, mental health because it all comes together. But, yeah. but for me, you have to look at all of it at the same time. 
if you focus on losing weight, you do all kinds of crazy stuff, which has you lose weight, but, but what's the impact on your body, your health, mentally, as well as physically and spiritually? You know, back in, uh, in ancient Greece, it's said that the original Olympians lived on primarily fruit and had amazing athletic, you know, performance. But, they, but the Greek government fed their soldiers meat. Why? It made them aggressive. The, the impact of putting meat into the body is not a positive thing in yeah. any, in any, from any direction as far as I'm concerned. And I, I mean, I understand. I, I hope I'm not losing all of our listeners. Most people eat animal products. Yeah. But, but we don't need to. And there are, there are many people out there who would say, including many doctors and health professionals who say, no, a vegan diet is definitely the healthiest thing you can do if it's done correctly. Yeah. Now, I, I, I go even further than that and say, hey, like, every other, like, like our closest primate relatives, the bonobos and chimpanzees with whom we share over 99% of our DNA, those species eat almost exclusively fruit when fruit's available. Yeah. And, with, you know, and they're pretty strong. Too. So. There, uh, a, chimp, a chimpanzee, unfortunately, can literally rip your face off, and they've done it. Yeah. People so, think it's a good idea to no. keep a wild animal as a house pet. A, a question about that, as far as, so yeah. you eat a primarily vegan, whole food, plant-based diet? I'm actually a 27 and a half year raw vegan, and I live on fruit. I don't have a stove, haven't had one for 20 years. So... Um, we here at the center, we eat, we, we as myself and volunteers who live there, hopefully my girlfriend will soon be joining me here um, with her kids. We, we live on fruit and simple salads and, and very, I mean, occasionally maybe some soaked nuts and seeds, but, but that's it. Nothing. No beans, no beans, no lentils. No beans, no beans ever. No. Nuts, sometimes nuts. Well, for, for me personally, the only time I really ever eat nuts anymore is when I am traveling and speaking, which I'll be doing again soon. I often, I often speak at raw vegan restaurants around the world and I'll, I'll eat there. I mean, if I, you know, I, I figure if they're going to bring me in and help support me, I'm going to sit down and have their meal and I like to leave some money there for them. That yeah. seems like the right thing to do. Yep. A lot, a lot of gourmet raw food will, will use nuts and seeds yeah. and I'll feel it. I don't, you know, I feel much better without having that concentrated fat or protein. Our protein needs are tiny. And there was a 2013 study that, that proved if you consume more than a tiny amount, you age and die faster. Your telomeres get shorter. Okay. By the way, the one, the one way to relengthen those telomeres, the one real significant way to relengthen those, I know all these biohackers are trying all kinds of stuff. The one way to really accomplish that is extended therapeutic water fasting. Fruit juices are concentrated sugar. Without the fiber, to slow down the absorption of that sugar in the bloodstream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, I mean, it, it's actually been hypothesized that we can see color, because not all species can, but that we can see color so that we can see ripe fruit. Okay? Now, imagine, now, remind me where you are. Utah. You're in Utah. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, I, I think we can probably agree that humans didn't originate in Utah. I mean, science actually knows humans originated in, in equatorial Africa and traveled from there. And there may, looks like there may be other tropical places too, but we're still tropical animals mm -hmm. because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would not want to be living in Utah outside in your birthday suit 12 months of the year. 100% agree. Yes. You can do it here in, in Costa Rica. You can do it. Right. I've got a shirt on because I thought it would be more respectful to you. Yeah. When I'm sitting here working, I typically don't have a shirt on. Yeah. If, I'm just, you know, if I'm just on my computer, uh -huh. and emails, et cetera. Um, you, don't need, you don't need clothing here. You could be naked in Costa Rica 12 months of the year. We are tropical animals. And in the tropics, if you're here in the tropical jungle, what would you be naturally attracted to? Yeah, just all the fruits and everything else. I probably wouldn't touch my vegetables. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think your mouth waters when a bunny rabbit hops by or an iguana walks on by. They're, they're, we're not naturally attracted to animals as food. Yeah. We have to be taught that. You know, I suspect if most people had to kill the animals themselves, they'd stop eating animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. 
right? We, I, I believe we are naturally frugivores like our closest primate relatives. Mm -hmm. And that diet not only has supported me perfectly well without a day sick, but it's also supported thousands of my clients all around the world, even in places where they can't get fresh fruit 12 months of the year. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier here. And I can't see ever living anywhere besides the tropics again. But, I mean, I, I've got 112 or 13 varieties of fruit so far planted on site. We're not harvesting everything yet. But I can walk outside every single day of the year and pick ripe fruit. You could. Now, living in Utah, you'd be getting most of these fruits from Mexico, from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And they'd be imported, probably picked too early, never fully ripened. It's not optimal. Um, you know, in, in Utah in the summertime, I would encourage you to eat the cherries and peaches and plums and nectarines and melons and all the stuff that's coming from the states around you. Uh -huh. uh, maybe, maybe some from Utah itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Utah, I think, is mostly desert, right? Yep. Um, so they may not grow so much food there, but there's a lot coming from California, not too got, far away. We've got peaches close. We have oranges close. We have cherries in my backyard. We've got nectarines. Sure. We've got, so. Yeah. So I would focus on the things that are, that are you know, as, as, as local as possible. Uh -huh. because, because, not because you need to eat for your climate, like macrobiotics teaches, but simply because that's the stuff that's going to be freshest. Yeah. Right? That, that's the stuff you're going to have the highest likelihood of being able to get at the peak state of, of readiness to eat when it's got the most nutrients. You want to pick it and eat it, you know, in fairly close proximity of those two events to each other. Here, almost everything we're eating is picked within four or five days at the most. Wow. Uh, but when you you buy food in the U.S., you know, go to Whole Foods and, and buy your fruit, some of that stuff was picked six weeks earlier, way too early. Some of it gassed to ripen, right? They use ethylene gas, which the plants, the fruits produce uh, naturally, but when they pick them too early, they, they put them in a room, they gas them to get them to start ripening. It's never the same thing. Yoshinori Osumi won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2016. And he won the Nobel Prize for his 25 years or so worth of work demonstrating how autophagy works and what's happening. And one of the aspects of his work was that it was much more efficient and much more effective, as they say in science, in starvation. In other words, while fasting. Yeah. Okay. When we stop eating and the body can put all of its energy into cleansing itself, autophagy, the pro which for people that don't know, auto autophagy means auto self fudgy or phagy eat self eat the body is is consuming and eliminating all the damaged cells all the garbage that doesn't belong the body gets rid of this stuff and it happens much more efficiently when we fast now i you know long before the, the 2016 nobel prize was awarded to him when i first heard of him i was well aware of this because i've seen this over and over again with thousands of, of clients over the years yeah interesting Well, I, I guess I don't really know what the answer is. It's a great question, and I, maybe I should be more focused on that. What I've tried to do is they show to you convert. They show up to you converted. You meet them when they're when they're a hundred percent. You're you're they, meeting. They, they've them. already raised their hand and said, "Hey, I'm interested in that." Yeah, and 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 everybody that I know in my world, you know, vegans are extreme for the most part, right? Like, yeah, yeah. so far we're so far away from that. Right. So it's how do you get people on that path? Because I've had a few friends, I've shared about my fast, and I've had a few friends that have messaged me, Dale, tell me more about it. And they said, oh, I did a two-day. It was amazing. I'm going to start doing this more. You know, I've had several people do that. So well, I think, I think that's exactly what to do. I think what you did, what you're doing, what you're doing here, right? You asked me to do this program with you so that you could share this information with more people. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I've done. Um, you're, you know, you mentioned earlier, I've got a YouTube channel where we're getting close to 500 videos. I've been making videos now for six years or so. Um, I've, I've written, I've, you know, I've done lots of programs like yours. I've been on radio programs. I've done a couple of TV programs over the years. I've written in magazines. I've been interviewed. Um, I speak at various events. Um, I'll be the, uh, one of the keynote speakers for a big vegan event in Tel Aviv in November, which, you know, again, it's, it's, it's going to attract vegans primarily and people are already interested. But, but the idea is, I think we convert people by helping to educate people. I don't 
go around self-identifying as vegan. I am a vegan. I don't use animal products of any kind. I don't own leather shoes. I don't buy silk or wool. But I don't identify that way. And I, I see a lot of ugliness out there. You know, people who think, and I understand where they're coming from. They believe, as I do, that we don't have the right to use harm or kill other species. Uh, and the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill people. It says yeah. thou shalt not kill. Um, I think that's quite clear. Uh, in any case, uh, you know, so, some of these people are pretty militant and they, they get in people's faces and, you know, talk, talk uh, pretty uh, in ugly ways about people who continue to eat animals. I don't, I don't think they're helping very much because I don't think anyone's ever been converted that way. Yeah. You know, I think the thing to do is to meet people where they are. So when I talk to people, I'll talk to anyone. I don't care what they're currently doing. I can remember back how my first uh, 30 years, I ate everything. You know, it's, why is it not quite 30, but anyway, I mean, 26 years. Is it a 36 hour water fast? Is it? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, again, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a bit about my own story because so I, I grew up, I grew up with some exposure to fasting, which might've made it easier for me to embrace it. Um, my, my family's Jewish. I'm not, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, but not religious. But I, I you know, we, in Judaism, as is true in many religions, many religions have some fasting protocol. And in Judaism, there, in fact, the religious people say there's many fasting days, but the one everyone is aware of and, and may observe is called Yom Kippur. It's a day of atonement where you spend a day, uh, theoretically anyway, we didn't always do this, but you theoretically spend the day in the synagogue praying for atonement for your sins for the year. You don't eat or drink anything. And so I'd fasted many day, you know, one day fasts growing up. And I was sick. I'd gotten worse with three years of medicine. Uh, I finally realized that medicine was only making me worse and that, in fact, medicine is pretty much all about suppressing symptoms. Health and, and suppressing symptoms have nothing to do with each other. Uh, suppressing symptoms actually makes you less healthy, not healthier. And so I started looking, I finally realized, okay, if I'm going to get my health back, I'm going to have to figure it out myself. And I started looking around and first I thought, okay, you know, maybe there's a natural diet. And I started making changes to my diet in the course of doing that and realizing that, you know, raw vegans seemed what was natural to me. Um, I came across a book called Rational Fasting written by a man named Professor Arnold Errett uh, back in the twenties. And he'd been dead since, I think, 1930 or 1929, somewhere in there. He died. You know, at the time, uh, and this, this may be shocking for some of your younger uh, listeners, but there was no internet, right? I mean, when I came across this book, there was, no, there was no internet. There was no YouTube. There was no Facebook. There was no Google. Um, we, had, we had kind of an equivalent, rough equivalent of Google. It was called the Yellow Pages, um, big phone book. And if you went to fasting in the Yellow Pages, you know what it said? Fast plumbing services? I don't it think said, It said absolutely nothing about fasting. Right? There was nothing there. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't even know this existed until I found this book. And I didn't realize there were, there were at the time actually a bunch of places in the U.S. that were still running, operating, uh, supervising fast, but I wasn't aware of that. And so I read this book, and this guy's talking about going weeks without food and how the body heals when we do that. What's and it called again? Sorry. It's called Rational Fasting Rational. By, professor, by Professor Arnold Errett. Yeah, there was, there was an MD from, I, I think he was back in the late 1800s, uh, maybe late, early 1900s, who said, take away food from a sick man's stomach, and you have begun not to starve the sick man, but the sickness. Okay, E.H. Dewey, uh, MD. Um, in fact, go back further than that. I mean, Dewey probably studied well, but the, the first Western physician... Hippocrates is, is, you know, the Greek was well known. There are two very famous quotes, one co-opted by conventional medicine, which says, first, do no harm. Oops. I don't know if you're aware of this, but after heart disease and cancer, mistakes of doctors are the third leading cause of death in the Western world. Really? It's officially called iatrogenic disease. So I haven't seen a doctor in 32 years, with the exception of trauma. When I uh, had an accident and sliced an, ar uh, an artery to my hand and all of my flexor tendons in two places, yeah. I, thought, I thought, you know, this, this might be a good time to go see a doctor. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. 
that's, you want to, sometimes you, you need to get trauma medicine. Trauma medicine is amazing. It saved my life more than once. Yeah. But, but I would never go to see a doctor for any other reason again. Uh, never, ever. Um, doctors only suppress symptoms. In any case, Hippocrates, his other famous quote was, let your food be your medicine and your medicine your food. And very few people have any idea what he said right after that in the same oration because his very next words were, right, so I'll back up, let your food be your medicine and your medicine your food. But to feed yourself when you're already sick is to feed your sickness. Interesting. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, so that's thousands of years old. How long to feel benefits of simply optimizing your diet? Most people after a month or six weeks are going to feel amazing. In fact, in a, in a week or two, most people are going to feel really, really good. Um, eventually, what starts to happen is the body starts being able to detoxify when they're not fasting, just because they're eating so much, so much lighter than normal so much less toxic than normal, the body begins detoxifying and some people are going to start to experience some symptoms. So a lot of people give up on this diet because they don't understand, hey, this is just your body cleansing. Interesting. Okay, so it may get worse before it gets better. Well, it'll get better and then it'll get worse and then it'll get better again. Got it. And then it won't get worse again. No. And if you fast, if you fast long enough, you can eliminate that whole cycle. Yeah. Fast, you get your body clean then you thrive on fruit and it works for everyone. I mean, so, literally everyone. What about complex carbs? Because based on what I always hear, it's like I eat oats for breakfast because I want some more complex carbs, you know, with fruit, I eat oats and fruit and peanut butter. Let me, let, me, let me ask you a question, Dale. What is your body doing with those complex carbs, do you know? Um, what do you need, what do you need them for? They're just more long-term energy. I don't, I don't know. I have no clue. It's just the, okay. my basic understanding says the fruit burns fast. This is the fast burning. This is the slower burning. Let's well, here's, the here's the interesting thing. So you have a car, yes? Uh-huh. Okay. You put gasoline in the tank? Uh-huh. Does that make your car go? Um, it, it makes it able to go in some way. That's, that's, that's right. It's, it's the fuel that allows it to go, but it's not what makes it go. What makes it go, unless you drive a Mazda, what makes it go is the action of the pistons going up and down that are turning, that are turning the crank, right? That are moving yep. the wheels. That's what's happening. It's actually kinetic energy, but you need that fuel to, to run the engine to create the kinetic energy. Food, we do not run on food. We run on electricity, microelectric current. And your body produces that electricity primarily while you're sleeping. So it's funny because we actually talk about that. We'll say, you know, man, I'm I gotta go recharge my batteries. That's exactly what you're doing when you go lay down and sleep. Yeah. You're recharging your and you wake up recharged, right? Because you've recreated that energy. And so here's the thing. This is hard for people to believe, but I started to say this earlier, we got we got sidetracked as happens. What most people think is hunger has nothing to do with the need for food. And if your body could speak to you in English and whatever language you might speak, you know, and, and when you're feeling that, that discomfort and emptiness and pain and whatever is growling, if your stomach could speak to you, it would say, hey, Dale, please don't eat. I'm trying to cleanse and heal right now. Yeah. That's what's going. That's why those symptoms occur. You eat and the symptoms go away, not because you were hungry, but because when you eat, your body says, well, now I've got to process this food. And so it stops cleansing and healing. And people think, well, I must have been hungry. That, that's, not, that's not what was happening. Do you take a day off? Do you do intermittent fasting or any sort of, I take a day off every week from eating or any sort of thing like that? I, I no longer take a whole day off very often. It happens sometimes. I don't do that as a, I did it as a regular program thing for two and a half years, uh, 25, 30, almost 30 years ago. Now what I do is, and long before the term intermittent fasting is coined, you know, it occurred to me, it occurred to me that I didn't eat breakfast, that I wasn't hungry. I'd eaten dinner. I'd, you know, maybe I'd been awake for a few more hours, but I didn't really do that much in most, most cases. Why would I need, well, how would I need another meal as, after sleeping all night, right? So I stopped eating breakfast. And I usually have my first meal of the day 
at around two or three in the afternoon. Now I've been experimenting. This is my third time I've tried eating just one meal a day. So I'm still feeling good. I've got plenty of energy. I've been working since five o'clock this morning. I usually work out every day. Um, I give a lecture every day. I do four hours or so of consultations with clients via Skype every day. Um, you know, ma managing my staff, lots of things going on. And over the last eight or nine days, my, my breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the one meal I've had, has been at around six o'clock in the evening. Wow. How many so calories I'm fasting are you eating? All well, um, I only need to eat around 1,000 calories a day or so to be fine, wow. maybe 1,200. Um, and uh, in case you can't tell, I'm not two feet tall. But yeah, yeah, you're not whittling away either. No, I'm I'm quite strong and fit uh, and energetic. And but the average person is taking food where much of the value has been destroyed by cooking and processing, and putting it in a body that doesn't work very well. You get your body clean and well functioning, and you're eating only food where all the nutrients are intact because they haven't been cooked and processed. We need a lot less to get our needs met. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Is that because of lower blood volume? Because it is. Um, there's various things going on. So blood pressure is going to come down when you fast. It always will. Um, the average person's walking around with a significant amount of plaque in the arteries. People who eat conventionally have a lot of it. People who eat much better than that, less. But a study published about six years ago in North America said the average nine-year-old's arteries were 30% were blocked with plaque at the age of nine. Uh. Um, a, a study 20 years ago said the average 14-year-old's arteries were 40% blocked with plaque. And what you can see is that it's gotten worse. The average nine-year-old six years ago, who's now 15 or so, it has more plaque in the arteries than the 14-year-old did uh, in that earlier study. And this is what happens. You know, this, this is what happens. So as the body begins to break that plaque down, your blood initially uh, is thicker, but the body filters the garbage out and your blood pressure goes down as a result of having a cleaner system and more flexible arteries. That's what's going to happen. Is seven days enough time for some of that plaque to have left? Well, the body begins breaking it down right away. And for someone who's relatively young, it might be enough to, to, to do something. But where there's hypertension, you know, the reason that my, my hypertensive clients almost invariably fast at least 21 days is because that's what they need to do in order to, to, to go. I mean, again, as I said earlier, we've got 100% success with more than 500 people. But in 21 days, they go from as much as 235 was the highest in stock pressure I've seen. That guy went down to about 110 in a 20-day fast, uh, and one tenth of stock pressure. And, and months later, it stayed... Low? As as long as they keep making optimal choices. Yeah. If they go back to doing whatever, I mean, most people get there as a result of lifestyle choices. Yeah. So if they go back to making the same choices, they're going to recreate the same problem. If they continue, you know, if they follow the protocol I give them. So when people fast with me, let's say it's a 21 day fast, they spend a week here, or if it's via Skype, they work with me for another week through the refeeding process. And then at the end, I give them a written document that reminds them how to eat for the next six weeks. And the truth is, it's really how to eat for the rest of their life. But if I called it that, nobody would read it. And so yeah. you know, for, I, I asked them for six weeks to follow the program because it'll take them at least six weeks to actually fully realize all the benefits they've already gotten from the process. Mm -hmm. And at that point, at the end of that six weeks, if they're not convinced that what I'm telling them it makes the most sense for them, they can then go back and eat whatever they think is the healthiest meal. I guarantee they're going to feel much worse as a result. Yeah, got it. Why would people choose you guys over the True North? Um, Besides going to Costa Rica where it's beautiful and- We're, we're going to need another hour to go through that. But uh, I, I'm actually wondering why anybody goes to True I mean, people go to True North largely because they believe that they need to have a doctor. And we're, I'm not a doctor. We don't have an MD on staff. That may change at some point. But fasting is a natural process, not a medical process. And what's important is that someone understands the process. Uh, no one's taken, uh, very few people have taken more people through the process than I have. So yeah. the differences are that we understand here 
that fasting is about getting out of the body's way. Our bodies are self-healing just like every other organism. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, there, there's more if you have a moment. I do. Um, you know, there, there was a recent study that said, as you can see, I read a lot of studies. There was a recent study that said that um, there's a direct correlation between the number of trees you have around you and your level of stress. Okay? okay. Being in nature has been proven to be healing to the body. And so here, um, we're, we're on 10 acres of tropical jungle and gardens. It's spectacularly beautiful. There's, there's a state road out front. We have an average of about one vehicle per hour. We have a high wall. We don't even hear much of that noise. Um, the rooms are all back here. Um, you know, it's, it's quiet. The air is clean. Uh, we're surrounded by trees. We have pure water, you know, perfect spring water coming up out of the ground. We're, we're uh, providing the highest quality food. People are, are taught about unconditional love and encouraged to forgive themselves and other people. They're encouraged to get on the ground, so they're grounding themselves. The, being in the vibrations of nature, we're, we're vibrating, but the average human body is vibrating at a completely different frequency than what happens in nature, and that makes us sick. And when we get into nature, our, our, it's like you, you strike a tuning fork and hold it in your, another one, and they start to vibrate at the same level. Being surrounded by this energy means we begin to vibrate with nature, and that's, that's healthy. That's healing. Mm -hmm. So. Here, you know, I, I closed this when we started talking. It was raining, and it was pretty noisy because um, it rains hard here. Mm -hmm. So there's a French door here I just opened. There's a big window here I just opened. I closed them because of the noise. Generally speaking, you know, when I'm not being recorded, they're open all the time. Um, yeah. uh, you know, if you've, you've seen some of the videos where I'm addressing the people here at the center, you yep. can't tell from that shot purposely. I mean, I sit in the same area. Actually, we just changed. I'm, I'm sitting on a stool instead of that same chair all the time. But I sit in the same side of the room because if I shoot in, in uh, other directions, there's too much light because that's a, that's a covered space that's completely open to the garden on two sides. It's a big space. It's 3,500 yeah. square feet. Sounds, sounds beautiful. It's amazing. But th those differences are, are huge. I mean, it's really how we operate. Um, yeah. every, everything about the philosophy behind it is quite different. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, I think we're so stuck in the uh, most people don't even believe that you could just not eat for a week and that that's not going to hurt you permanently in some way, you know? Sure, sure. So, yeah, you're right. Crazy. Well, I'm going to immediately after we get off this call, I'm going to go eat a mango. <laughs> I'm going to plan my trip to get the papaya, too, because we've got a great store with lots of fresh papaya all the time. Well, this has been super helpful, Lauren. Thank it's you. It's been for a pleasure. No, it's been a pleasure. Part of it, and um, I would love to. I've got tons of stuff to take from this, and I know that it's going to be super helpful. Good. So thank you for being with us. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure.